You fool! Warren is dead. Welcome to Horror Babble. We've got a gem of a tale in store for you today, folks. The Destroying Horde by the great Donald Wandre. This one was first published in the June 1935 edition of Weird Tales. We hope you enjoy it. The Destroying Horde by Donald Wandre. A tale of giant one-celled organisms spawned in a chemist's laboratory and an orgy of hideous death. One. Officer Bert Williams thought what a beautiful spring morning this was, as he attended to his usual duties. He had for some months been given a special assignment at the State University. It was he who tagged cars that had overparked the time limit of one hour, saw that students' spirits did not become too combative, and kept watch for signs that the name of the 18th Amendment was not being taken in vain. As he strolled along the campus, which was situated near the geographical center of two adjacent cities, and distributed tags where he felt that they would improve the car owner's memories, he was also thinking what a comparatively monotonous life he led. The student body was a peaceful lot. Hold-ups had been few. Gangster and racketeering activities never approached the university grounds. So far as his work was concerned, he might just as well have been assigned to traffic duty. Still, it was a warm, sunny morning, and he felt the fever of spring. A few students sauntered casually by, a squirrel frisked around the ornamental oak trees with lively purpose. Birds chattered excitedly, where an unseen nest was probably about to be raided. The south wind blew gently with the breath of quickening life. The world was wakening from the long sleep of winter, and a drowsy restlessness pervaded all organic life. Officer Williams continued his leisurely pace down the row of cars illegally parked in front of the chemistry building until he had reached the end of the line, which was also the end of the block. Across the street stood the animal biology building, toward which his duties would next take him. He waited while several automobiles and a streetcar clattered past, then took a step forward. From the building came at that precise moment a shrill cry of torment, chilling and startling, in the otherwise peaceful scene, a cry of nerve-tearing anguish. "'What the heck?' growled Officer Williams. "'Sounds like somebody was getting killed.' He dashed across the street, and at the very curb skidded to a sudden halt, with his eyes bulging. From an open window on the second floor, a great, roundish, jelly-like thing, the size of a bushel basket, had emerged, and was clinging to the sill. As the policeman stared at it in consternation, it slid over the edge of the sill and half-dropped, half-crawled to the ground down the side of the building. "'That's a rum-looking animal,' Officer Williams muttered. "'Never saw anything like it before. What's it gonna do?' He eyed the object with a watchful and slightly apprehensive gaze. He didn't have long to wait before obtaining an altogether too clear idea of what the curious beast was going to do. For barely an instant he was able to survey it while it lay supine a dozen yards away from him on the grass next to the animal biology building. It had a kind of iridescent shimmer and seemed semi-liquid or like a jellyfish in consistency, thick and viscid. It was approximately spherical, seemed to possess no limbs or appendages, and looked a kind of pale, dirty grey in colour, with a faint tinge of rose suffusing its mass. Officer Williams had no time to pursue his scrutiny further. The object suddenly began rolling or crawling toward him, he couldn't decide which, at a disconcertingly rapid pace. Oh, my fine beast, so that's your game, he said, 
Well, here's one for you, and I hope you like it. He drew out his surface gun, took quick aim, and fired. The bullet plopped into and through the thing. The hole it had ripped promptly closed, and without a falter in its progress, the mass flowed on toward the policeman. He emptied his gun into it vainly. The substance was only a couple of yards from him, when it dawned on him that it might be wise to get out of its way. His action was characteristic. Instead of turning to flee, he bounded high over and beyond the object, racing onward a dozen paces and reloading his gun as he ran. Then he cast a swift glance over his shoulder and spun around with a gasp of horror. Attracted by the sound of shots, people were craning out of windows and passing autos slowed to a stop. But the policeman's eyes were fixed on the co-ed who had stepped around the corner of the animal biology building, unwittingly into the path of the spheroid mass at the moment when he had fired. A blank look transformed her features, and she fainted. The object rolled toward her, and upon her. There was a curious contraction and quivering of the heap. Visibly, before the policeman's eyes, the limp body was absorbed, consumed, digested by the creature. A kind of fury shook Williams, and again he emptied his revolver into the heap. The bullets ploughed through without effect. A crimson tint grew more pronounced in the gluey pile. It swelled to larger dimensions, while a kindly darkness lay upon the unknown ghoul, who had gone blankly to a hideous death. The officer shook himself from his daze. Could this nightmare actually be happening in the broad light of day, and on the finest morning of spring? Automatically, he reloaded his useless weapon and gasped as an incredible thing happened. A doubly large substance stirred and moved away, leaving a gruesomely white skeleton behind it. For a moment, the thing shook strangely, contracted in its middle, and abruptly separated into two segments. Where there had been one object before, two spheres now rolled silently and grimly away as though that were the signal that released a general hypnotism of terror, Babel broke out and wild confusion reigned. The heads disappeared from windows, automobiles roared into life, doors banged, excited cries pierced the air, and above all came another tormented scream. A tremor of indecision held Williams motionless for an instant, as the voices of humanity and duty both called. There were people inside the building who could help him who had cried out, he thought. Duty won. He raced to the station box a block away, and almost ripped the phone out in his haste. Williams, number 49, call in, he stuttered. Strange animal loose at the State University. Already killed one girl. Bullets don't stop it. Send out the radio cars and riot squads at once. Rope off the whole district, and for God's sake, hurry!" He banged the box door shut, without waiting for official confirmation, or even hearing the bored voice that remarked, "'Better lay off that stuff while you're on duty.'" There was no sight of the two sinister shapes as he sped back to the animal biology building. They had disappeared somewhere, nor had any courageous person yet come to cover the pitifully white skeleton lying on the grass. But the living demanded greater attention than the dead, and Williams tore around the building's corner and took the steps at a leap, almost bursting through the doors in his haste. Second floor, someone shouted as he entered. He made his way toward the main stairway, but he did not reach the second floor. A little cavalcade was descending the stairs. Three students and a young instructor, all white-faced and shaken, bore a limp burden between them. Before Williams could utter a word, one of the bearers spoke out. No time to talk now, officer. This man is badly hurt, and we've got to get him to the university hospital before he dies from loss of blood. Who is he? What's happened? Professor Anscott of the biology department. We don't know what happened. 
Williams followed the group as it hastened toward the hospital, two blocks distant. On the way, he surveyed the burden that the men carried, and again he felt an inner turning of his stomach. Professor Anscott was a slender, grey-haired man of perhaps fifty, with the intellectual features of an ascetic, and yet with the finely moulded contours also which indicated a sensitivity to ultimate values. What sickened Williams were his legs. From the thigh down, they had been stripped of every fragment of flesh. Only the bones remained, raw and starkly whitish. Above the knee, they were stained by trickles of red that still oozed from the fleshy stumps around which rude tourniquets had been twisted. The pallor on his face indicated how dangerous were his wounds, and how much he suffered from loss of blood. But his head shook feebly, nervously, and he moaned unintelligible words, although consciousness had left him. As Williams's eyes took in his slender hands that hung limp and his spare frame, he thought, by the looks of it, he's a goner. It'd take a pretty tough man to come out of that, but I miss my guess if he's got any reserves. All the while that he followed the gruesome burden, he kept a watch for further signs of the predatory beasts. Instinct held him in constant readiness for any emergency, even though he knew that his revolver would be useless. Again, he was torn by conflicting desires. His place was back there where the things were. Yet he had a hunch that the disaster would be explained if Anscott could be made to talk. Williams had a good head for putting facts together, and seeing how they formed a sequence. Animals the like of which no one on earth so far as he knew had ever before seen, do not as a general rule suddenly materialize out of nothing on spring mornings. The beast had unquestionably emerged from the animal biology building. With his own eyes he saw it come. Someone within must have possessed it, or been responsible for it. The chances were that the owner was Anscott, because of his eminent position, and because the building was under his supervision. It was Anscott who had screamed, and Williams knew to a certainty, as he looked at the fleshless legs, why he had screamed, and what had caused the terrible mutilation. At any rate, Anscott was the likeliest person who might be able to explain the mystery, if he lived to talk. If he didn't, well, William shrugged his shoulders. Were there more of the strange spheres, or had he seen the only one? Was it capable of disjointing and rejointing itself, or had it split into halves for good? Williams breathed easier when the group arrived at the hospital without having sighted the unknown creature. In the receiving ward, a cluster of staff surgeons immediately surrounded the unconscious professor and rushed him to the operating rooms in an almost hopeless attempt to save his life. How long will it be before they're through with him? He asked the nurse in charge. She looked up from the report that she was busily filling out. Amputation of both legs, suture of veins and arteries, dressing and bandaging. With doctors Colby and Warren together working on the case, an hour at the very earliest. An hour was too precious to waste in waiting now. Williams grabbed a telephone and put through a call to headquarters. Williams call in from the University Hospital, he spoke rapidly. Have the nearest radio squad stop and pick me up. In barely two minutes, the official car drew in. The police department is taking charge. I'll be back in an hour. Allow Anscott no visitors until we've talked to him, he commanded the head nurse. With that, he dashed out. Before the radio squad came to a full halt, he had pulled open the door and entered. The car picked up speed and swung toward the center of the campus. What's going on here? Jeffries, the driver, and Mulcahy he asked in the same breath. I don't know, but it's sure bad. Some sort of animals got loose. You can't kill it, at least with bullets. It got one girl that I know of, and maybe more by this time. Siren shrieking, the car squeezed through a space that opened up for it on Washington Avenue, one of the intercity traffic highways which cut through a side of the campus. 
pandemonium reigned. The invisible wildfire that mysteriously warns people of danger had swept the district. A continual stream of automobiles left the territory, which had already been closed to incoming traffic. Classes halted, buildings seemed to empty themselves, hundreds of students thronged the streets and lanes leading to safety. Raucous horns and cries mingled confusedly with the shriller high notes of whistles. Where to? inquired Jeffreys. Toward the river. That's where they were heading when I last saw them. The river was the Mississippi, which marked the western boundary of the campus. The car leaped ahead. There wasn't a better driver on the force than Jeffreys, who now proved his uncanny skill by dodging, threading, and twisting his way through a one-direction jam of traffic that extended from curb to curb. They had scarcely gone a block when they heard a staccato burst of firing. Almost immediately afterward, there came from somewhere ahead three sharp blasts of a policeman's whistle, and the chilling sound of a human scream. "'That's where we'll find them,' said Williams grimly. "'Keep yourselves ready. You've never been up against anything like this before.' Traffic thinned out. Jeffreys drove the car as though it were an express train down Washington Avenue. A couple of blocks ahead hung the bridge that linked two cities— at the near end of the bridge, they could make out a scattering group of men, some swiftly rolling objects, and two or three sinister white heaps. There was a truck lying on its side, too, and some squealing animals that ran madly in every direction. Pigs! grunted Jeffreys disgustedly. So that's your strange animal, is it? Well, you— His jaw hung open, but he didn't finish his sentence. One of the rolling objects overtook a pig. There was a blurred thrashing, and with incredible swiftness, the pig somehow dissolved into the ball that covered it. A police captain was racing toward them with hand signaling. Jeffrey slammed on the brakes, and the man piled in as the car decelerated to a screaming halt. Wait here for reinforcements, the captain panted. Can't do a thing with those brutes. Got three of our men already. I told them to get back in cars, where they can do their shooting in safety, and at least have a chance to get away if necessary. What happened here since I sent the alarm in? Are you Williams? Say, what do you know about these things? Nothing more than you do. And Williams told in a few brief sentences what had caused him to turn in the alarm, while all four kept their eyes warily glued on the scene half a block distant. "'God knows how we're going to stop them,' said the worried captain. "'But we've got to. I pulled in here less than five minutes ago. Just after we came, a livestock truck somehow broke through the guard across the bridge. I sent one of the men down to head it off on this end, but before he was halfway there, one of those brutes rolled out of the trees by the river bank and landed square in front of the truck.' The driver must have lost his head. We saw his front wheels jerk sidewise, and the truck crashed. He was thrown clear out, and I hope instantly killed, for that big blob simply rolled over on him and ate him. The man I'd sent opened fire, and he's a crack shot, but his bullets didn't phase the brute. The pigs ran all over, squealing like mad. Five or six more of those blobs suddenly rolled out of the bushes and went after the pigs, hunting them down. There were six of us to begin with, and we all opened fire. But we might as well have shot at the sky for all the good it did. The things went on eating and rolling, and I'd swear I saw one of them split in two and each half go sliding off. Then they started after us, and, well, there are only three of us now. Only three of the spheres also were in sight, and they were occupied with the last of the pigs. As the captain concluded his brief account, they heard the weird wail of a siren, and a few moments later, a riot squad car roared toward them. The captain hailed it. Got any grenades or bombs? Yeah, but not many. I think there's four. The captain took two of the grenades and passed the others to Williams whom he apparently put special confidence in, solely because Williams first had encountered the beasts. 
the three huge spherical masses had finished with the pigs. For a moment they quivered uncertainly, then, as by a concerted movement, began rolling toward the policeman. But where three spheres had been, there were now six advancing swiftly. Try the guns on them again, ordered the captain. We'll keep the grenades in reserve. Concentrate on the nearest one. Ready? Fire. A blast of shotgun, submachine gun, and rifle fire literally tore the first mass to pieces. But the other five came on like the wind. Again! Another burst ripped to shreds a second mass, but the rest were within yards now. Two down! shouted the captain exultantly. Simultaneously, he and Williams heaved the grenades. A third monster vanished, blown to minute particles. The other intended target slewed sidewise, and the grenade exploded harmlessly. Run for your lives! someone bawled. We can't get the guns reloaded fast enough! Then the creatures were upon them, and all semblance of order vanished. A man yelled and went down before a sphere that got him from behind. The riot car began to pick up speed, and the captain made a wild leap for its dashboard before it was too late. In the first frenzied scramble, Williams jumped crabwise. For a moment, he had saved his life, at the expense of Mulcahy's. The Irishman, who was standing by Williams, believed that bullets would stop anything alive, and he stood his ground, emptying his revolver at the grey blob. "'You fool! Run!' screamed Williams. And then the gluey mass was upon Mulcahy, and his limbs flailed vainly as he was sucked into it. A kind of horror seized Williams, as he saw the body of his friend being hideously consumed. Hardly aware of what he did, he flipped the grenade. Man and beast vanished in the explosion, that gave at any rate a clean death. He heard another explosion follow close upon his, and looked up. The captain had flung the last grenade at the monster that was devouring the first man to be overcome, but he flung it a second too late, and the monster finished and moved off just as he threw it. William saw it coming, and turned with a shout, "'Come on, Jeff!' But the radio car remained where it was, and Jeffreys made no answer, since skeletons are forever silent, and the sixth creature— Glutted with the victim whom it had evidently trapped while he watched the main battle, dropped heavily out of the car, and likewise began hastening toward Williams. If Williams ever felt the unnerving grip of fear, he felt it then, with the remaining two grey beasts driving toward him from opposite directions like balls of smoke. He knew that his gun was useless, that he could never outrace the devouring things. There was only one remote possibility of escape. He sped toward the sphere between himself and the car, and dived clear over it, sprawling to the ground. He was on his feet in a flash, and bounded onward toward the car. But the grey beast had abruptly reversed its motion, and was closing the gap with terrifying rapidity. Williams won by a leap. He thanked God that the motor was running, as he jumped in and crashed the door shut. The skeleton that was still huddled in the driver's seat crackled grotesquely as he shoved it aside. The pursuing animal plopped against the side of the car as Williams threw it into gear and almost wrecked the mechanism in trying to force it into instant high speed. Just before he reached the bridge, he saw another cluster of the strange beasts emerge from the trees and begin rolling across the bridge toward the city beyond. Oh my God, Williams muttered, with a kind of despairing reverence. There'll be no stopping them once they're on both sides of the river. But there was nothing that he alone could do to prevent them from reaching the opposite side. As if by magic, another sphere materialized in the street. Williams didn't try to avoid it. Rather, with a savage delight, he roared down upon the monster. The car thudded into it, and skidded completely around as though on ice, and a shower of 
slimy stuff spattered the windshield, a substance greasy and malodorous. Okay, back to the hospital, and that Anscott fellow it is then, he said softly, and sped up Washington Avenue. Two. An unnatural silence now lay over the campus. Not a human being nor a car was in sight, and all the busy sounds of activity that characterized the usual day in any city were strangely absent. Perhaps a few timid souls were still hidden in the apparently deserted university buildings, but if they were, they gave no sign of their presence. Can Anscott see anyone yet? Williams inquired breathlessly, after he had hurried into the reception room of the hospital. It's a matter of life and death. Well, if it's that important, yes, but only for a few minutes. He has just been returned from the operating room, and cannot be subjected to any strain. Room 27, left wing, ground floor. Williams was already hurrying down the corridor before she had finished her statement. He paused for a perfunctory knock at room 27, and was opening the door when he heard a faint, Come in. Anscott, swathed in bandages, pale and emaciated of face, and with a feverish light brightening his eyes, barely turned to look as Williams entered. What is it you want? The voice came, weak and tired. Williams stated his purpose as briefly and quickly as possible. And so you see, he concluded, why it's necessary to find out all we can about the beasts. I am sorry to have to intrude upon you, but you can understand the danger. What are the things? Do you know anything about them? How did they get loose, and where did they come from? A slight sigh issued from the wasted figure on the cot. A vague, faraway look appeared in his eyes, and he seemed to be thinking of other things, or marshalling elusive thoughts. My worst fear has been proved true, then, Professor Anscott at length said slowly, and the blame rests entirely on me, even though an accident was responsible. The beasts, as you call them, are not animals. They are protoplasm. They're what? Protoplasm. The primary stuff from which life developed. Or from another viewpoint, they are giant, one-celled amoebas. Uh, amoebas? echoed Williams foolishly, the conversation thus far having failed to convey much meaning to him. Yes, amoebas. Artificial ones, or, if you prefer, manufactured ones. Manufactured? Yes, answered the professor a bit irritably. Or at least, the first one was. I have realized the biologist's dream of creating life in a laboratory from man-made materials, and with every step controlled. A sound knowledge of chemistry, physics, and biology, plus a little experimenting, were all that was necessary. You will find my notes and an account of my work among my papers in the laboratory. I would advise you to destroy them, as I most certainly shall do myself if I recover from these injuries. For many years, biologists have been on the verge of creating life. Undoubtedly someone else will rediscover my method, even though I obliterate my results. But I am ready to close my inquiry, now that I have witnessed its disastrous results. All organic life, as you probably know, is based on the substance called protoplasm. The simplest form of such life is the one-celled amoeba commonly found in stagnant water. I analyzed the amoeba until I knew exactly what its chemical equivalents and constituents were. That was my first step. But one cannot merely mix a group of carefully weighed chemicals and expect an amoeba to develop. Even that organism, low as it is in the evolutionary scale, is a system infinitely less complex than the human body, to be sure. Yet in its simple, 
unicellular nature, offering almost insuperable difficulties to everyone who has tried to create it out of basic chemicals. The materials must be wrought into a pattern, a system, an organization. And when I had succeeded in this second step, still a third and the most difficult of all remained. I had fashioned something that was to all intents an amoeba, except that it did not live. It was as dead matter as any corpse. The spark of life was lacking, the vital force that would activate the inanimate substance. It wasn't until Millikan discovered the cosmic rays that I was on anything like the right track. I then pursued my investigation along the lines suggested by his work, and was finally able to control cosmic rays. You will find that apparatus likewise in my laboratory. A week ago, under the stimulus of the cosmic rays, my artificial amoeba came to life, stirred itself, absorbed food, and in general behaved like one of nature's amoebas. That moment was the peak of my life, beyond which nothing can ever again rouse my enthusiasm. It was a discovery of greater significance to mankind than Columbus's showing the way to the Western Hemisphere was. The glow of pride and successful accomplishment of a brilliant feat shone for an instant in the aged scientist's eyes, until it was replaced by a haunted look, and he resumed his account. An amoeba, besides being a simple organism, is minute in size. Having solved the major difficulties, I now wanted to continue the experiment on a larger scale, so that I could watch every step with an eye unaided by microscopes or lenses. Furthermore, since my remaining years were likely to be few, I wanted to learn as much as possible in the shortest time possible. To that end, I deliberately changed the chemical constituents of my next amoeba for two purposes. First, I wished to create one of large dimensions, which would not be dependent on water for its habitat. Second, I wished to speed up its natural function so that I could study within a period of hours what would otherwise require days. Unfortunately, uh, I succeeded. I created a giant new kind of amoeba this morning. A shudder of pain racked Professor Anscott and he bit his lips as the pain-deadening Novocaine began to wear off. You created one? interrupted Williams. Then how does it happen that there are so many of them? The scientist smiled bitterly. The answer is fission. An amoeba reproduces by the simple process of dividing itself into two individuals, a process technically known as fission. You yourself witnessed my amoeba split into two parts after it had digested food. In some ways it is like an animated stomach. The amoeba is a viscous thing which absorbs and digests food directly. It moves by a contractile projection of parts of its surface. For a moment, a frown of intense concentration wrinkled his forehead. According to what you have told me, the first fission occurred about twenty minutes after I brought the amoeba to life. We may assume, then, that so long as food is plentiful, fission will occur in each individual every twenty minutes. If all the individuals survived, and it is sadly evident that most of them have, there were eight at the end of the first hour. There are sixty-four now, less those you killed. In an hour there will be five hundred and twelve. Within twelve hours, there will be millions of them. Why did you let the first one out? Great God, how can they be stopped? Burst out Williams. I didn't let it escape, came the answer from pain-twisted lips. It was an accident. About ten minutes of the cosmic ray were needed to animate the first amoeba. I forgot when I created one which would live at an abnormal pace, that the spark would also start it going more rapidly. My back was turned when it came to life. I received my first warning with a terrible pain in my legs, as the thing began to— Ah! Uh, 
digest me alive. And Scott's countenance was white with suffering now, and his eyes burning with fever, as he tried in an almost inaudible whisper to finish his account. I suppose it was my scream you heard. I drove the brute off. Would have killed it if it hadn't mutilated my legs. I... You what? Williams asked desperately, anxiously. What did you do? Tell me, how were you going to kill it? How did you drive it off? But there was no answer to his frantic questions. Consciousness had slipped away from the wounded man, and a nurse hastened in with a morphine hypodermic to alleviate the searing pain that had been growing around the stumps of his legs. Sorry, but you'll have to go now, she told Williams. The hypo will wear off in a couple of hours. You may return for a few minutes then, if you wish. There is no chance of his regaining consciousness earlier. A couple of hours, muttered Williams in dismay as he retraced his steps down the corridor. Where there were only some sixty of the things now, there would be several thousand of them within two hours. Despite the warm day, a cold moisture dampened his face. At the receiving room desk, he paused to telephone headquarters for orders. They were simple. Every available man was ordered to surround the district where the creatures had broken loose, except for Williams, who was to remain on guard at the hospital generally, and over Anscott specifically, until the precious information was divulged. The next two hours were a nightmare for Williams. The radios in all rooms had been disconnected in order that patients would not be alarmed, but for the benefit of the staff, the key set in the reception room was kept on. Minute by minute, the scenes in a tragic drama were audibly unfolded. The destroying horde was multiplying even more rapidly than Anscott had predicted. Hundreds and hundreds, possibly thousands already of the giant amoebas, were devastating an area of almost a square mile in the heart of the Twin Cities. Low as the organisms were in the scale of life, their ferocity was unparalleled, their tenacity appalling. It seemed impossible to destroy them, except with high explosives whose use was restricted, partly by the nature of the region infested, and partly by an actual shortage of dynamite. The radio, newspapers, and whistles had broadcast a general alarm. All available men were asked to unite in attacking the danger. Weapons of every sort came out of storerooms and hiding places. Two great streams worked at cross-purposes. Converging lines brought hundreds of volunteer fighters to resist the horde. Diverging lines carried the thousands who, by all sorts of conveyances, were evacuating the city. Along a circular battlefront of about three miles comprising both sides of the river, the battle was raging, and the line of struggle was steadily widening. Staccato of guns and the bursting of explosives were answered by cries of mortal agony when some fresh victim was caught and consumed. There was no way of estimating how large the death list had grown. Undoubtedly, dozens and perhaps hundreds of human beings had perished, with the total swiftly mounting. Any living organism, human or animal, seemed acceptable to the voracious amoebas, and their astounding ability to multiply made the menace of their well-nigh indestructible nature doubly powerful. Outside aid had already been requested. State troops were on their way now. Of manpower there was no shortage, as yet. But the nearest large supply of munitions was five hundred miles away. The local stores were on the point of exhaustion. Long before transport airplanes and fast express trains could arrive with additional explosives, the peril would be beyond control. Once the amoebas were numbered in millions, or even thousands, mathematical reduplication and multiplication would result in their splitting and spreading faster than they could be destroyed. Citizens could indeed barricade themselves in homes and buildings, 
sealed against entry by the organisms. But what good could be accomplished? Starvation would eventually force the occupants out, to be pursued by the prowling and ravenous monsters. And when the amoebas had multiplied beyond check in the Twin Cities, could there be any checking of them? They were likely to roll out in every direction, a circular tidal wave, engulfing whatever living creature lay in their path, protoplasmic, irresistible death racing across the country, devastating cities, and devouring men with a cumulative rapidity. Tense and restless from the excitement, Williams gripped his chair till his knuckles showed white, or paced back and forth. This inactivity was as great a strain as battling the amoebas had been, but he had his orders, and he was too loyal to disobey them. There were moments when he cursed the biologist who lay dying as the result of his own work. Yet it was not Hanscott's fault that the first amoeba escaped. If anything, he must be blamed for having been too thorough, having laboured too well. The materials out of which he fashioned the giant unicell had also given it gastric activity of hitherto unknown power, efficiency, and nearly instantaneous absorption of food. The radio continued to tell a story of disaster. All along the line, men were perishing, and the line being forced back. From time to time, an amoeba was slaughtered, and more slowly now their numbers increased, but the slight check was futile, for they still spread with a speed far greater than any possibility of restraint. Williams was fidgety from inaction when a subconscious intuition that something else was wrong came to him. He had seen nothing to alarm him. His ears had not been startled by unfamiliar sounds. He sniffed the air inquisitively, without being able to detect the trace of a foreign odour. Whence came this intangible warning, this sense of imminent danger? He could not say, and although he looked around him and saw nothing unusual, the impression persisted. Say, he suddenly addressed the girl at the reception desk, are you sure that all the windows and doors in this place were closed? Could anything get in? Certainly not, at least without ringing a bell or smashing its way in, she replied crisply. Everything was locked tight when we received the first warning. Williams looked at her. She seemed about to make some further remark and her eyes gazed past him and opened wide. Her face went dead white, and she slumped to the floor in a faint. Williams whirled around. From the corridor to the right wing, a giant amoeba was issuing. All his faculties froze in that first instant of panicky horror and bewildered shock. The terrible possibilities that might come true with the thing loose in the hospital overwhelmed him. He knew not whether to flee or attack. Irrelevantly, he wondered how the creature had gained entrance. Not till later did anyone discover in room 18 the skeleton which was all that remained of the delirious patient who had crawled from his bed and opened the window for fresh air. The moment passed, and Williams went into a whirlwind of action as the amoeba emerged. He swept up the chair beside him, and hurled it crashing at the viscid mass. The organism rolled sidewise, but not quite quickly enough. The chair thudded against it, and for a second its progress was halted. With the same motion, Williams had turned around and leaped for the corridor to the left wing. The monster disentangled itself from the chair, and rolled after him. There were few places within immediate access that promised safety, and of those few, almost without thinking, he chose Anscott's room. He raced down the corridor like a shot, knowing that at every step the amoeba shortened the gap. He did not even try to look back and see how close the hungry organism was. He fled with the wings of fear and the desperate hope of safety. He reached the door of room 27, with the furious patter of his running feet grimly echoed by a sinister and ugly gurgling rustle. 
he burst into room 27 and forced the door shut with the more than human strength lent by terror, closed it as a heavy weight thudded against it from the other side. Trembling, shaken by the narrowness of his escape, he braced himself against the door for a long minute while he gulped in great lungfuls of air. He could hear the ominous sounds made by the monster on the other side as it prowled around and tried to find a way in. They ceased shortly, but without giving Williams any relief, for he did not know whether the thing had gone off in search of other prey, or whether it had stationed itself for an indefinite wait. He too might have prolonged his watch, if his attention had not been diverted by an unintelligible muttering from the supine figure of Anscott, who tossed restlessly in the fever of delirium. Water? asked Williams, and strode to a table where a pitcher stood. He forgot even the danger outside, in the appeal of suffering to his humanity, and poured out a glass of water, which he raised to the patient's lips. Fire! Fire! moaned Anscott faintly. Williams felt his forehead. It was hot and dry. Gosh, he sure is burning up all right, the policeman thought. Here, drink this, he said aloud. The dying man swallowed the fluid thirstily. Though his eyes were wild with the light of fever, and his face wasted to emaciation, instinct helped him to what his wandering mind could not see. His body shook convulsively again, so that the remainder of the water spilled, but he continued to murmur, Fire! Fire! Out of his head. Crazy, Williams thought. What the heck does he want fire for? Anscott twisted aimlessly, and the seconds flew by. It was obvious that he had not much longer to live. Suddenly, an incoherent jumble of phrases poured out, faint and rapid, so that Williams had to bend low over him in order to hear. Fire! Fire! Burn it up! X-ray! Take that, you spawn of hell! Oh God, my legs! Now it's gone, I, I should have closed the window, but they'll catch it and burn it. Help, help! I'm done for! <laughs> Fatty tissue! If only I'd kept the blowtorch burning! The unguided voice went on, ever growing feebler, but Williams heard no more. He stood as one transfixed, the apparently meaningless words seared into his brain like flame. In a flash, he saw it all. Anscott working in his laboratory, with his back turned to the as yet lifeless protoplasm. The awakening of the mass, and its silent attack on the scientist. His frantic manipulation of an X-ray machine, that somehow drove the giant amoeba away. And all this precious information wasted, hopelessly wasted. If Williams tried to escape by the door, the amoeba would devour him. He peered out the window, only to see more of the organisms coursing swiftly across the hospital grounds. There was no telephone in the room. If he pushed the night bell, he would only summon a nurse to gruesome living death from the monster, if the bell was heeded at all. He was ready to risk his own life in a futile dash, and the simplest possible idea occurred to him together with the deepest disgust he had ever had for his occasional obtuseness. Swiftly, he reached out and tore a sheet from the bed. Sorry, old man, he whispered gently. It's our only chance. With the sheet over one arm, he hurried to the door and listened intently. He could hear nothing. As noiselessly as possible, he whipped a pocket lighter from his trousers, flicked it, and touched it to the corners of the sheet. Spreading lines of flame began to race inward. He jerked the door wide open and peered out. The huge amoeba had been halfway down the corridor, on the point of pushing back a loosely closed door to one of the wards. At the sound that Williams made, it turned and instantly began rolling toward him with its strange, swift motion. There was a whiteness on his face 
but there was no shrinking away or trembling of his hands as he waited, even though the running lines of flame scorched him and licked around his fingers. He waited till the protoplasmic mass was less than ten feet distant. Then, in a continuous and dual movement, he flung the burning sheet over the creature and leaped backward towards safety. Instinctively, the giant tried to dodge in vain, for the sheet billowed out and dropped squarely upon it. William saw a mad flurry and writhing for an instant, heard a weird, voiceless sibilance, and all at once the smoldering blaze flamed hotly brighter with a greasy sputter. Some people think that the narrative ends with the story of Williams's frenzied dash to a telephone, and of how headquarters sent out an excited message, and of how gasoline, wood, blowtorches, x-rays, gas, and acetylene torches were commandeered everywhere to fight the destroying horde, and of how for two entire days the relentless battle raged along a roughly circular front of approximately five miles, before the amoebas were checked, and the last of their thousands destroyed. But the real end of the story lies in a grave at Oakwood Cemetery, whose headstone bears a simple inscription to the memory of George Anscott, who half solved the mystery of life. May he succeed as well in the mystery of death. If you enjoyed listening today, be sure to subscribe to the channel by hitting the red subscribe button below. After doing so, click the bell icon next to the subscribe button to receive new content notifications. If you'd like to support our work and receive exclusive perks, consider becoming a channel member by clicking the join button below. To support us in other ways, see the video description for links to our Bandcamp and Patreon pages, our merch store over at Teespring, and further information relating to our releases on Audible, iTunes, and Spotify. And until next time.